You are listening to an Elam International Church podcast. Right now, we're going to hear another powerful Sunday message. And our prayer is that you are encouraged and empowered to love God, love people, and make disciples no matter where you are. Church, how you doing tonight? Man, it's exciting to be here tonight. I just get a sense that God, He's already doing something, but man, I just want us to lean in tonight. Because he has something in store for each and every single one of us tonight. Uh, I get such a sense that there is an atmosphere of freedom in this place tonight. The Bible says where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And man, I, as we're in worship tonight, I just really felt, and as I was just looking around and seeing what God was doing in this incredible group of people, that there is something on this house for this time for Wellington City. Man, I just get such a sense that God is about to release something over this church that is going to pave the way for our city. I was reminded in uh, the story of the Israelites and when they are about to enter into the promised land and they send out the spies and Caleb comes back with a different report. And I, I, just, I just got this sense that a lot, of people, uh, a lot of people in Wellington have written this city off to believe that its greatest days are behind it. But this is a church that's going to speak a different report. This is a group of people that's going to speak a different report. And I don't know about you, but our city needs a move of God. Our city needs a fresh move of God. And I just believe that God is doing something in this hour, in this house. And it is such an honor to, to bring the word tonight. And um, it's really just a joy. And I just want to honor Pastor Boyd and Chaz as well. Can we give it up for them? They're amazing. You know, uh, when I met Pastor Boyd, he kind of came into our lives at a pretty crucial time in our lives. I don't have time to really share this story, but I remember uh, being in this, uh, man, if any of you have been in ministry a wee while, it can get tough at times. You sign up for the, the times where you're like, man, God's so good, I'm going to just change the world, and then it gets tough, and you're like, oh my gosh, I didn't sign up for this. But uh, some of those times are the most crucial, and uh, Boyd and Chaz came into our lives at a, a crucial time, and when we were... Um, I guess really looking at what God had ahead for us and they spoke life over us. They spoke encouragement over us and uh, I'm so grateful for you guys and uh, that you are building an incredible church but you're also building amazing leaders that you speak into the next generation of ministers uh, and we're just so grateful for you in our lives and it's such an honor to be on the platform and uh, share the words today. One more time, can we give it up for Pastor Boyd and Chaz? It's amazing. You can grab a seat, you can grab a seat. Thank you so much worship team. Uh, and tonight, I'm going to be continuing uh, the series on the parables. Let me just open my iPad. I tried to be real smooth about it, but that just wasn't happening tonight. Uh, tonight, uh, I have the honor of, of continuing this series. And as I was in preparation uh, for tonight, I was uh, kind of praying into maybe what God would have me share out of His Word. And I, w- I was kind of thinking, okay, I want to preach something that's in line with the teaching in your house at the moment. And I was thinking, okay, I'm going to come and I'm going to prepare. And if I don't have anything... Maybe I'll just pre- preach a message, be that, just, just jump in as the guest speaker and preach a message and sign my book outside. And I probably need a book first, I do not have a book, but that'd be the first step. Uh, but as I was preparing, I, I really felt God place this word on my heart uh, for this moment and for tonight, uh, for this house. And, and I really believe, and, and my prayer for us uh, tonight is that as we open the word of God, as we uh, come around his word, that he would unlock something in our lives, that as we really apply His Word to our lives, something would be unlocked that that I believe um, in this next season in your life and in your ministry, whatever it is, whatever it is that God has called you to do, that as you live this out, as we understand what this principle means, that we would actually see God do great and mighty things in our lives. How many want to see God do something great in their life? Well, tonight we're going to talk about the power of sacrifice. You want to see God do something great? We're going to learn about the power of sacrifice. Uh, to, uh, if you've got a Bible, why don't you turn to the book of Matthew, chapter 13. And I'm going to tonight be talking about the parables of the treasure and the pearl. The parables of the treasure and the pearl. Matthew, chapter 13. We're going to be reading from verse 44 to 46. And this is a parable that many of us might have read and potentially just skipped over. This is in a, uh, a context of time when Jesus was sharing and teaching and sharing stories and He was teaching about many parables that many of us will know of. The parable of the sower. The parable of the wheat and the weeds. There are are many parables that we will have read into, but if you're like me, you might have skipped over this and just thought this is just a couple of verses. 
What is the importance of this? But I believe that this teaching of Jesus is central to our lives as his followers. It says, it says in verse 44, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure that a man discovered hidden in a field. In his excitement, he hid it again and sold everything he owned to get enough money to buy the field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant on the lookout for choice pearls. When he discovered a pearl of great value, he sold everything he owned and bought it. He sold everything he owned and bought it. Why don't we pray tonight? God, we thank you that you are here with us right now. God, we thank you for what you're doing in this house, in this time. And Lord, as we come around your word, God, I pray that you would illuminate truth to us. God, you, you say that your word goes out and it will not return void. God, I pray tonight that you would just do a great and mighty work. Lord, I pray these would not just be good ideas, but it would be your truth, that you'd minister, that you'd move in lives. Let freedom come tonight. Let transformation take place in our hearts tonight. We surrender these moments to you and we ask that you would have your way in Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said, amen, amen. amen. Tonight, as I said, I, I want to talk about the principle of sacrifice that is central in the kingdom of God. And Jesus was talking about a man or men in these stories who discovered something that was of such great value that they then went and sold everything they owned just so that they could take hold of it. They made such an extravagant sacrifice because they found something of such great value that they couldn't do anything else but surrender everything to take hold of it. And I don't know about you, but that sounds incredible when we read about it. But we as humans, we like to hang on to things. We like things in order. Would anyone else here tonight say they're a bit of a stubborn person? No, no honest people tonight. I'm a stubborn person. I like things to be done in such an order. I like things to be done in a methodical fashion. And my incredible wife, Vic, she is amazing. Uh, we've been married for four years, and I'm so grateful for her. She's actually preaching at Arise tonight. Uh, we really didn't plan our lives that well so that we could be there to support each other, but that's okay. Um, I'll listen to her back later, and I hope she can listen to me back later. That'd be awesome. Um, we uh, have been obviously on this journey of marriage, and you begin to learn things about one another. Something I've learned about myself and about my incredible wife is that we like things done differently. I like things done fast, and she likes things done right. <laughs> I like things done as quickly as humanly possible so that we can move on, especially when it is around things like cleaning. I would say that I'm quite a neat and tidy person, but I would say that I probably don't have much structure or method to my cleaning. Over the last, uh, last week, we've decided we needed to... Uh, to clean our house, we bought, we bought our house a couple of years ago, and I don't know if, anyone, if there are any homeowners here, and you've bought a house, and you've just kind of taken care of the main rooms, but there's one room in the house that you really haven't like, packed away all the boxes, you just thought, I'll sort, I'll sort that out later. Well, we've had over the last year um, a, bit of a, a bit of a wardrobe malfunction, our entire chest of drawers fell apart, but we decided, you know what, my, my theory, just out of sight, out of mind, let's just shut the door, and we won't worry about it till later. But Vic decided we need to sort this out. And she decided we're going to sort out the wardrobe and we're going to sort out the linen cupboard. And I thought my plan was I'm going to sort this out real fast. So yesterday I decided I'm going to attack the mission that is the linen cupboard. So I started and I moved pretty quick. And I just shoved all the towels in there and shut the door and I heard something fall out and I thought I'll worry about it later. <laughs> Vic came in and said, what was that? She already knew what it was. I said, oh, it's the linen cupboard. It's sorted, babe. It's fine. It's all good. She said, no, no, what have you done? I said, oh, it's, it's fine. I think I've just put it all away. We can look at it later. She said, no, no, we need to do it now. I didn't want to do it now. I wanted to move on. I wanted to watch TV or something else. We need to do it now. I didn't really want to do it now. I just wanted to have things done the way that I wanted them. We then opened the cupboard to realize that the shelving units we'd put up had just collapsed because I'd just thrown all the towels upon them. <laughs> so then we had to start again and go, it all, go, go over it all over again. I had a method that I wanted, and it wasn't that effective. And I didn't really want to change, if I'm honest. I just thought, look, this will work really well, and then we can move on. Yeah. This might be a trivial example, but I think sometimes in our lives as followers of Jesus, we can apply this to our faith. 
that we say, God, I want to follow you wholeheartedly, but I want to live my life in order in such a way that I can comprehend. But we must understand that in the kingdom of God, we cannot live in a way that just suits us and pleases us. That Jesus is saying that sacrifice, that laying aside what we want, the methods that we want, is central to what it means to be a follower of Him. And He's talking about the power of laying aside everything else to take hold of the kingdom of God, to take hold of a life lived following Him. And I think the reality is that we like things the way that they are quite a lot. But as a follower of Jesus, things can't be just the way that they are. You know, I'm grateful for the grace of God that meets us where we are, but there is also a part of grace that empowers us to live differently. That when we come to Jesus, we can't just stay the same because when we begin to uncover who He truly is, we want to live in such a way that honors Him. And I wonder tonight if maybe for some of us, we might be here and we might be saying, man, I want to follow Jesus, but I actually just want to live my life in a methodical way that I can understand. But there has to come a point in our lives where we must realize that we have to surrender, that we have to sacrifice our understanding to say, God, whatever it is that you have for me, I want to lay aside what I want and trust that you have a better way. And we've got to realize that sacrifice is part of the kingdom of God. Sacrifice is in fact central to our entire system of faith and belief. If it wasn't for the sacrifice of Jesus, you and I wouldn't have access into intimacy and relationship and salvation with our heavenly father. And so as his followers, we have to model the life that he first lived for us in the way that we go towards God. And and tonight, I I really want to unpack the power of sacrifice in the kingdom of God. And I want to maybe look into what Jesus was saying as he shared this parable. And my prayer tonight is that something would come alive afresh in our lives. I I really feel that this message might not be necessarily a new thought. Isn't it funny? We often say new thought. We just teach the Bible and it's just over and over again what's been taught for thousands and thousands of years. But I really believe tonight if we could take hold of this, then I believe we would just have a fresh revelation of who Jesus is, of what he's done for us, and what it means for us to be his followers. Does that sound good tonight? Awesome. You know, tonight, as I was preparing for this word, I just felt God just rock my world and just speak to me afresh. And man, I've just been thinking about this all week as I've been preparing. And and tonight, there are a couple of examples of the power of sacrifice that I want to talk about. And one cannot go without the other. I want to talk about what Jesus has done, and I want to talk about our parts to play as well. And so tonight, we're going to cover and unpack a few things that this parable shows us about the principle of sacrifice in the kingdom of God. And if you're writing notes, write this down. The first thing, we sacrifice when we understand the value of the kingdom. We sacrifice when we understand the value of the kingdom. We've got to realize that nothing in this world will truly compare to what Jesus offers us. We've got to realize that nothing that the world offers will truly satisfy the longing in our heart that only Jesus can truly fulfill. Philippians chapter 3 verse 8, Paul says this, everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ. It's not doing things for Christ. He says, no, the value of knowing Christ, that Christ, Jesus, he is the prize. He is the goal. Jesus, my Lord. I love it how I I kind of like finished that last sentence and then forgot there was another little line there. Christ Jesus, my Lord, for his sake, for his sake, I have discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage so that I could gain Christ. I have laid aside everything else, counting it all as loss, another translation says, so that I could gain Christ. You know, I think that for many of us, we've tried to search for value in things that are promised a lot but delivered little. I think for many of us, we've tried to seek after things that appear to be good, but as Paul is saying, are actually garbage in light of Christ and what he's done. I don't know about you, but sometimes in my life, in my journey, I can come to church and think, this is good, but I need to add some supplementary things to my faith. 
And God, you've got this part of my life, but let me keep my finances. God, you've got this part of my life, but man, does a kingdom perspective on relationships really make sense? God, you've got this part of my life, but actually I just want to preserve my business. I don't know how to be a business leader with a kingdom mindset. Do you truly believe that the kingdom of God can offer you something that is greater than anything that the world tries to promise? Do you truly believe tonight in your high school that living with a kingdom perspective is greater than living with a worldly perspective? In your university, do you truly believe that God has placed you there to be an ambassador of his kingdom? Do you truly believe that what you are following is worth it? Man, I think for too long we've just come and we've come to church and we've been in these environments and we've thought these things sound really good, but will they actually be worth it? Is God's way the best way? Jesus said in the book of John chapter 10 verse 10 that I have come that they may have life in all of its fullness. He says, I have come that they may have life and have life abundantly. Jesus says life twice. He's talking the first time about eternal life. But then the second use of the word life is talking about our life here on earth. So yes, he promises us eternal life. But he says, while you're here on earth, your life is going to be better for it. That I haven't promised you a second rate way of living. But actually, the life and the kingdom that I have for you is greater than anything that the world can offer. But I wonder tonight, are we living with that belief in our hearts? Because the reality is we will not sacrifice for something that is not worth sacrificing for. We would not lay aside everything in our lives if we did not understand the value of following Jesus. You know, I I believe that tonight, God wants to realign some people to realize that only His way will satisfy. That living a life with a kingdom mindset is greater than living a life with any other mindset. You know, when Jesus is talking about this treasure in the field. He uses the word thesaurus, which you guessed it, we get the word thesaurus from today. And that word means a place where good and precious things are gathered up. Where good and precious things are gathered up. You know the word, I don't know if I've got the, it's thesaurus, I don't, I don't know if that was exactly right. It means the place where good and, and precious things are gathered up. If Jesus is inviting us to follow him and to discover good and precious things, how will we discover them? He's given it to us in his word. You know, this field that this person is searching for, when he discovers the treasure of Christ, he lays aside everything else. Do you know you and I have access to the treasure of knowing Christ through his word every single day? That he invites us to open up the scriptures and search So Jesus, where are you in this moment? All throughout the Bible, from the beginning to the end, you will see Jesus present. At the beginning of time, at the creation of the world, he was there. He was prophesied about before he even came to earth. That there were types of Christ that existed all throughout the Bible. You will see Jesus in the pages of the Word of God. But are we searching for that treasure? Are we searching for him in his Word? You know, I think sometimes we can lose sight of the value of the kingdom of God. We can lose sight of the value of knowing Jesus. We can lose sight of the value of what it truly means to know him. You know, when I go to antique stores with Vic, Vic has decided that she wants to get some antique furniture for our home. She has an incredible eye for detail, which I do not. And we go to these stores and she'll be looking at this lamp and she'll be like, babe, look how good this lamp is. I just think, man, That's so nice. I saw one that came out a few weeks ago. It looked very similar. (laughs) Did you know that it was by this designer? Did you know it was it was made in this in this era? Oh, I did not. Looks great. (laughs) She has an eye, and she can see what is valuable and what is not. I think sometimes we can be looking at things and see them to be valuable when, in fact, they are actually just a replica of the real thing that God has for us. Jesus said, do not store up treasures here on earth where moths and vermin will destroy, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. I just get a sense that sometimes many of us, we store up things that appear to be valuable, that we store up treasures on earth that appear to be valuable. But Jesus is saying, no, no, no. 
A life lived after my kingdom, it won't look like something that is valuable, but you will find true value that nothing of this world can take away. Isaiah chapter 55, verse 1 to 2. I love this passage of scripture. It says, Come all who are thirsty, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why spend money on what is not bread and your labor on what does not satisfy? Listen to me and eat what is good and you will delight in the richest of fear. I love, I love these verses because they're saying that nothing else that you could labor for, nothing else that you could search for will truly satisfy. That when we come into the presence of God, when we come to know Him and to live a life in accordance with His will and His kingdom, nothing else will truly satisfy like that. And He's calling us tonight. He's inviting us again tonight to say, actually, the kingdom way of living is better than any other way. I'm looking for things. I've tried searching for things, but it's only the kingdom of God. It's only a life sold out for Jesus that will truly satisfy. But I wonder tonight, do you believe that? Do you believe that his ways are higher? Do you believe that his way is greater? Man, I I just get a sense tonight that God wants to remind us again of the value of his kingdom, that we have brought it down to a lesser level, that we have thought this, this could just be a part of my life. No, no, he's calling us to be all in tonight. He's calling us to be wholehearted tonight. He's calling us to surrender tonight, but do you understand the value of his kingdom? The second thing is that to follow Jesus means to live sacrificially. To follow Jesus means to live sacrificially. Matthew chapter 13, verse 44, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure that a man discovered hidden in a field. In his excitement, he hid it again, and sold everything he owned to get enough money to buy the field. This man discovered something that was of incredible value, and then he went away and sacrificed everything for the sake of taking hold of that. To follow Jesus, say, God, you've got my whole life. God, I'm surrendering my life to you. I wonder tonight, are we living our lives in such a way that we're saying, God, you've got every part of me. God, I'm surrendering myself wholeheartedly to you again. Or have there been things in our lives that potentially we've just decided we're going to withhold? God, you've got this part, but I'm just going to keep this for myself. The Bible doesn't say, Jesus doesn't say that the man sold everything that was worthless to him. Everything that was second rate. No, he said he sold everything that he owned. Can you imagine how that would have looked to the people around him? Can you imagine how foolish that might have looked in the eyes of the world? That he would have laid aside everything for the sake of knowing God. You know, I think sometimes, and we read it all throughout the Word of God, when God calls His people to take steps of faith, to take steps of surrender that don't quite make sense to our natural minds. That when He called Abraham to sacrifice his son that he had promised that out of him would come descendants for generations and generations. I don't know about you, but I don't think that would have made sense to his natural mind. But it says that Abraham got up the next day, the very next day. He didn't wait a moment and he said, I'm going to go. I don't know about you, but I think sometimes in our lives, the things of God look like they might be a little bit foolish to the eyes of the world. But God isn't always calling us to make decisions that seem like they make sense in the eyes of the world. And I want to ask us tonight, when was the last time you took a step of faith that maybe didn't make sense to those around you? When was the last time that you took a step of faith that maybe seemed a little bit foolish? When was the last time that you took a step of faith that even though you didn't have all the answers, you were holding on to that word from God? You were holding on to what He promised you. You were holding on to what He called you to do. I'm not talking about forsaking all wise counsel. We need wise counsel in our life. But when the voice of God says so, and when we, I think that's important that we go to people that we trust, but when God says so, we've got to take that step. When God says go, we can't just say, I'm just going to hold back. We can't just say, you know what, I'm going to hang on to things in my life. I'm going to try and preserve my life. Jesus, in fact, said this in the book of Matthew chapter 16. 
but just after Peter takes him aside and says, no, God, there's got to be, Jesus, there's got to be another way. You can't go to the cross. There's got to be another way. And he says, get behind me, Satan, because you don't have in mind the things of heaven, but the things of man. And then Jesus said to his disciples that if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up your cross and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? Is anything worth more than your soul? If you try to hang on to my life, you will lose it. But if you lose your life, if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. The call to follow Jesus means that we must surrender. The call to follow Jesus means that we must lay aside our way of living. The call to follow Jesus means that we must put aside our own way and say, God, I am surrendering to your way. And the reality is without a great sacrifice, there is no great reward. Without the cross, there is no salvation. Without the blood, there is no forgiveness. Without the blood, there is no redemption. Man, I don't know about you, but if Jesus has paid the ultimate price, then how could we not live our lives in full surrender to Him? How could we not, when He says, I want you to take that step of faith, say, you know what, God? It might seem difficult. It might seem foolish. But we've got to trust that your ways are higher, that your way is greater. But here's the thing. The man found the treasure. He saw value in the treasure. We've got to see value in the kingdom of God. And then he sacrificed. If you don't realize that the reward waiting on the other side of your sacrifice is greater than anything that the world will offer, then you will not truly surrender. We've got to realize that, man, God is calling us to give up some things, but what He calls us to take hold of is so much greater. Man, I I just really want to encourage us tonight that on the other side of your surrender is an incredible reward that is greater than anything that the world could offer. You know, for... My wife and I, we've been uh, youth pastoring at Arise Church for about seven years. And um, tonight, I'll, I'll, I'll share a little bit honestly, but we've had a pretty wild ride over the last few years. They'll be putting it mildly. And about two, two years ago, a whole bunch of kind of things were going on with our church, and uh, we were processing a whole lot of things. And we felt in the middle of everything going on, God told us, stay in shepherd Stay in shepherd. And I'm going to be honest, we didn't really want to. (laughs) Sharing real honestly tonight. But we felt like God had told us to stay. We felt like God had told us to stay when he'd called others to go. And a lot of people looked at us and thought, what are you doing? A lot of people looked at us and thought, why are you here? And to be honest, I wondered many times, why am I here? But God had said so. And I had to realize that he put me in this position. He called us to this. And if he hasn't called us anywhere else, we've got to stay faithful. And I wrestled with it for many, for many, many months. I'm thankful for my wife who's a lot more level-headed than me. And she said, if God's told us to do it, we've got to stay. And in that time, I found myself questioning, God, why have you brought us here? You know what the thing that I actually had to surrender in that moment was? I had to surrender what other people thought about me. I had to lay down my fear of man. There were things that I didn't understand, but I had to follow the voice of God and not be worried about the opinions of others. You know, in that season, God began to do a work in us. In that season, we began to see God move in a fresh way. In that time where we were struggling with, God, have you called us here? Have you placed us here? We began to meet a bunch of other youth pastors around our city, people like the incredible Michaela. We We began to just dream and believe that God might actually have something for the next generation in Wellington. We began to see something take place as youth ministries came together. We began to see God begin to move in the next generation afresh. Man, if you told me a year ago that what we'd be seeing God do now and in in for this city and on, on Friday night, we're going to be down in Christchurch gathering a bunch of youth ministries down there. Soon after, we're seeing other youth ministries in other cities reach out. It's, it's not because, I honestly, I look back a year ago, this is not because, honestly, we are not that good. <laughs> like, we're not that good. But it is because of the faithfulness of God, and we had to hold on to a word from Him. 
There were moments where I thought, man, I, I, maybe I should go, but God said stay. And I want to speak to someone tonight, and you might be in a season right now, and you don't know why God's placed you there. People might be telling you, why are you doing this? People might be saying, are you sure that you should take that step of faith? Are you sure that that is God? Go seek out wise counsel, please. Go to people that you trust. God has given us and placed us in community for a reason. But if God has said so, you've got to go. If God has said so, take that step. If God has said so, start that university ministry. If God has said so, sacrifice the things that look like they're just comfortable and take that step of faith. I don't know about you, but I think we need a generation of people who are going to say, I want to live a life of sacrifice again. I don't know about you, but I think we need a room and a group full of people who are going to say, you know what? Man, I'm trusting God, even if it looks like it's going to cost me a little bit. Because the call to follow Jesus is going to cost us some things. But I got to tell you that the reward on the other side of that step of faith is so much greater than anything that you could find in this world. But are you willing to make the sacrifice? What is it that God's called you to sacrifice? Is it comfort? Is it having your life in order? Is it finances? Is it job security? Is it being liked? Is it pleasing people? What is it that he is calling you to lay aside for the sake of his kingdom and his call? I wonder tonight if we could say, I want to be like that man in that parable. I want to be a follower in the kingdom of God. This is, I'm laying aside everything else because I find great value. Greater value than I could find anywhere else in the kingdom of God. And I want to live in such a way that is obedient to what God has for me. And I, I, just, I just get a sense that God is in this place tonight. And, and I really believe that he's just going to realign us I was driving in tonight, and I just felt that tonight is just going to be a night where God just realigns some people back to what really matters. Whatever we withhold is always related to the area of which we don't trust God. Whatever we withhold from God is always related to areas of lacks of trust. Whatever we withhold from God is always related to things that we're just saying, I don't know if you actually have a better, a better plan for Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. I've been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Man, we can forget that our, this life, it's, it's not our own. We're here to be representatives of Christ. We're here to say, God, not my way, but yours. Not my will, but your will be done. You know, we in our complacency and our comfort sometimes, we can forget the power of sacrifice in our faith. You know, Jesus, he never promised that we'd live lives of comfort. He did say, he did say you'd be content. Paul actually writes about contentment. But he never promised a life of comfort. But in the struggle, in the sacrifice, we begin to draw closer to Christ. We begin to take hold of what he has for us. We receive the fullness of what God has when we truly surrender. You receive the fullness of what God has for you when you truly surrender. And our world needs followers of Jesus who are willing to lay aside everything else for the sake of the kingdom. The last thing tonight is this, the team come and join me. Our second perspective that is inextricably linked with the first, that Jesus is the example of a life of sacrifice. You know, God's calling us to live a life of sacrifice, but no one has demonstrated sacrifice greater than Christ himself. If it wasn't for the greatest sacrifice of Jesus, you and I wouldn't have access to the greatest gift of salvation. You know, I, used to, I remember reading this parable and thinking, man, this is good, this is... It's just about a believer that sacrifices for the sake of the kingdom. But as I was reading it this week, I began to realize, and God began to speak, and as I was studying this, I began to realize that actually in the kingdom of God, there is no debt 
that we could have paid in our own strength. That we couldn't sell enough things to pay the price of our sin that in fact separated us from God. That there is nothing in our own strength that we could have done to pay the price to enter into the kingdom of God. Stay with me here. Because I think sometimes we can read these things and think, that's awesome, that's great. If I just do enough, then I'll be approved by God. No, no, the Bible never says that our righteousness will enable us. It never says that our righteousness will enable us to enter the kingdom. The Bible, in fact, says that our righteousness is like filthy rags. But that's why the cross was so necessary. That's why Jesus, the perfect, spotless lamb who was slain, for the price of our sin enabled us to walk in right relationship with God. And you know, as we read these verses, Jesus has been sharing in parables before, the parable of the sower, the parable about the wheat and the weeds. And he's talking about that person that is giving something, that is giving something away. That's Jesus, that's God. So when we read this, we actually begin to realize that he's not just talking about the life of the believer who's saying, I'm going to sacrifice everything. No, Jesus in this parable is illustrating his sacrifice. Catch this. It says that the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure a man discovered hidden in a field. In his excitement, he hid it again and sold everything he owned to get enough money to buy the field. If we could not pay the debt that was owed, then who did? Jesus paid the ultimate price on the cross for us. And we've got to realize that in this parable, as we read this, that Jesus paid the price for our sin. That Jesus loved you so much that you were His treasure that He was willing to pay the ultimate price. You might be thinking, what do you mean by this? 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 to 20, Paul says, you have been bought with a high price. You might be thinking, are you stretching this? No, no, this is the Word of God. You have been bought with a high price. You were that treasure in the field. You were the one that Jesus saw and said, I'm going to pay the ultimate price so that you and I could be reconciled in relationship. Man, you've got to realize that this parable isn't just illustrating the life of a believer. Yes, it is. But it is also illustrating the sacrifice of Christ. And I want us to understand this tonight that if we do not understand the price that Jesus has paid for us, we will not truly know what it means to sacrifice our lives before Him, to lay down our lives before Him. Romans chapter 12, as I read before, Paul says, in view of God's mercy. Not saying to gain God's mercy, to gain salvation. No, he's saying in view of God's mercy, our response is to live our lives as sacrifice before God, to live our lives surrendered before God. And I want us to catch this tonight that we've got to realize that we were of great value to God, so much so that He sent His Son to die on the cross for us. And you might be saying, I've heard that before. Are you living it out? Oh man, I understand that. But are you living it out? Oh, I've heard heard that preached in church before. But is that revelation that's come alive in you? You don't, there is nothing that you could do to earn your salvation. There is nothing in your righteousness that you could do to earn access to relationship with our Heavenly Father. And that is why He sent Jesus, why God, the Bible says, God put on flesh and, and made His home in the neighborhood, came and died on the cross for you and I so that we could have access to relationship with our God. You've got to understand this tonight that you and I, we are valuable in the sight of God. You know, as we surrender, we do so as a response to what Jesus has already done. As we surrender our lives before God, we don't do so to gain anything. We do it as a response to what He's already done for us. And we cannot understand the power of surrender. We cannot understand the power of sacrifice if we don't truly understand what God has already done for us. You see, these two parts of the parable are inextricably linked because we can't live lives of surrender if we don't understand the surrender 
that Jesus made on that cross. You know, I was thinking about the early church. I was thinking about what God did in that time. The move of God that they saw. And it didn't, believe, it didn't begin because the believers were comfortable. It didn't begin because they just had their lives sorted out. No, it began because they saw, they saw what Jesus did. And they said as a response to that, I want to get a little bit sacrificial. I want to get a little bit bold. I want to believe that the same power that rose Christ from the grave lives in me. You know, Acts chapter 2, verse 42 to 47. It says, All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, sharing of meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. A deep sense of awe came over them, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. All the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They, shared, they sold all their property and possessions and shared money with those in need. They worshipped together at the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper, and shared their meals with great joy and generosity, all while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all people. And each day, the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. You know, two verses later, it actually says that what they owned, they realized was not their own that they were willing to surrender everything for the sake of the gospel, that they were willing to surrender everything for the sake of the kingdom of God. And when the believers began to live self-sacrificial lives, the church began to grow. Man, isn't it interesting that in our Western Christianity, as we've become more and more inward focused, that we've seen the church shrink back. Man, I believe, and I just get a sense that in this next season, that as the church begins to say, and as the people of God begin to say, I want to surrender my life again before God, man, we could see a move of God again. We could see God do something in our city. We could see God do something in the church. Catch this, a self-sacrificial Christian is more attractive to the world than a selfish, lukewarm believer. A self-sacrificial Christian is more attractive to the world than a selfish, lukewarm believer. We are a greater witness to the world when we live lives of sacrifice. We are a greater witness to the world when we live lives of sacrifice. We cannot live comfortable, church. There is a hurting and broken world out there that needs some believers to get a little bit bold again, to say, I'm gonna surrender my comfort. I'm gonna surrender my will. I'm gonna live a life saying, not my will, but your will be done. I don't wanna live in accordance with my way. I wanna live in accordance with your word. God, if you said it, I believe it. God, I'm willing to forsake everything else for the sake of your kingdom. God, if you've given me this word, if you've called me to go, then I'll go. If you've called me to pray, then I'll pray. If you've called me to step out in faith, I'll step out in faith. Man, if you've called me to this city, I'm gonna stay in this city and I'm gonna be faithful to what you've told me to do. If you've called me to start that university ministry, I'm gonna start that university because you've said so. Oh man, if you've called me to be a little bit bold again in my high school, in Wellington College, in Rongatai College, in Onslow College, to say if Jesus has changed my life, if I remember and I have a revelation of what He did on the cross, then I wanna surrender my life and tell the world that He is alive, that He is risen, that He is the King of Kings. Come on, is there anyone tonight who's saying, I'm willing to get a little bit unashamed of the Gospel again, because I believe that it is the power to save those that believe. Man, I just get a sense that tonight, I just get a sense that God would remind us again that He's called us to live sacrificial lives. He's called us to say, I'm forsaking everything else for the sake of the kingdom of God. As a response to what Jesus did for me, I'm, I'm laying aside everything else. I'm following. I'm being obedient to what you've called me to do, God. Come on, why don't you stand your, your feet across this place? We've got to realize the kingdom of God is worth, it's of great value. That God has called us to live sacrificial lives. And that Jesus is the example of true sacrifice. Tonight, I want to pray for a, a few groups of people tonight. And I really believe that God is going to move in your life tonight. And I really believe that something significant is going to take place in many of our lives tonight. But before
before we do that, I just want us to close our eyes right now in this moment. Just lift your hands across this place if you feel comfortable. As I was praying and, and, and as I was preparing this week, I just felt God remind me afresh of what He did on the cross. Jesus remind me afresh of the sacrifice that He made. Man, I... I was confronted by the fact that I've taken that for granted. I was confronted by the fact that I've taken that and just been a little bit flippant about it. But if it wasn't for Him, if it wasn't for His sacrifice, I wouldn't have eternity with with my God. And so I, I just really believe that God would remind us again of what He's done. Jesus would bring a fresh revelation into our hearts of the cross, of the power of the cross. You know, Revelation chapter chapter 2 is written to a number of churches, but I was reminded of these words that it said that you have persevered, you have stood through trials, but I have one complaint, that you have forsaken your first love or the things that you did at first. Turn back to me and come back to that place again. You know, I believe tonight that God is calling some of us just to say, I'm coming back to that revelation of the cross, the simplicity of the gospel, that it's because of what Jesus has done. Man, I wanna wanna speak to some of us tonight and you've got a great understanding of the Word of God. But do you have a fresh revelation of the cross? I don't want to just know more and more about God. I want to know Him more and more intimately. As I know more about Him, I begin to know Him more intimately. But I want to encourage us. Can we not forsake the simplicity of just what Jesus did on the cross? So right across this place, lift your hands. Lord, right now, we come before You. And we're so thankful for what You did. Jesus, we're so grateful for the cross. We're so grateful that You pay the ultimate price that the unpayable debt of our sin, it was paid for on that cross. That your blood that covers, that atones for our sins, that you shed it on the cross so that we could know you, that we could stand before our King, that we could stand before our God. And God, tonight we're grateful. Lord, I pray right now that in our hearts where we've maybe gone astray, where maybe we've just said, you know what? I get that, but it doesn't matter anymore. Lord, bring us back. Remind us of that first love. As David prayed, as David said, restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to obey you. Restore to us tonight the joy of your salvation. Would we be reminded of the cross, of what you did, of the price you paid in Jesus' mighty name, in Jesus' mighty name. Thank you for joining us for an Elam International Church podcast. To hear more messages like this, make sure you check out below. Or well, for more details, you can find us at www.elaminternational.org.nz.